Genesis. We're reading through Genesis, or we have been this week, and uh, particularly in chapters 11 to 14. And I want to home in on a little bit from chapter 11 and then chapter 12 this morning. There's so much in this whole section, by the way. I looked at it and thought, well, where can I begin? And more importantly, where can I stop? Because there is just so much. So there will be stuff I leave out. You'll have to read that for yourself and understand it for yourself. So starting in chapter 11 with verse 27. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. You don't have to remember all these names. Now, Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, or Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. Chapter 12, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Sheshem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, east, on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So uh, Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Now, as far as the whole Bible is concerned, chapter 11 of Genesis is very close to the beginning, but really it's the turning point in the whole story. It's a turning point in the history of the world because God, in chapter 11 of Genesis, reveals to Abram his plan to put right everything that is wrong with the world. He chooses one man, Abram, to reveal his plan to. And really, the whole of the Bible after that is... First of all, in the Old Testament, it's the story of Abram's family, and it's the story of God working out this plan. 
And the great climax is the coming of Jesus Christ, who was, of course, a descendant of Abraham, which was the new name that Abraham was later given. And from there on, we see again and again more and more of God's plan working out God's reality, God's truth, God's person being revealed. But it all starts here in Genesis chapter 11. God didn't say to Abram why he was going to bless him as such. He just said he was going to. But we know that he was going to do it in order, or rather through putting right everything in the world that was wrong, through his son Jesus Christ who was to be a member of Abram's family. What a blessing for Abram. So everything that's wrong with the world, God has dealt with. So the first question, what's wrong with the world? Well, first of all, God made the world and he made us to know him and to love him and to serve him. And what's gone wrong is that we have chosen and we choose every day not to know him but to ignore him. Not to love him but to love ourselves or someone or something else. And not to serve God but to serve ourselves or someone or something else. And the Bible calls that sin. That's what sin is. It's putting something or someone else in the place of God in our lives. And the result of doing that is that we lose contact with God and we lose our understanding of the true meaning of life. God becomes remote, distant. We're not sure about him. We don't know him. And it's our fault. It's not his fault. We put all sorts of things in God's place. But in the long run, nothing satisfies us. Nothing brings us lasting peace of mind. Nothing brings us genuine hope for the future. Without God, we are lost. We face an unknown future. We face an uncertain destiny. Death fills us with fear because we don't know what comes after. But God is love. And because he's love, he's done something to restore what is wrong, to restore our relationship with him, to undo our sin, if you like. And he chose Abram and his family as the means through which he would do it. Abram is such an important character in the story of the Bible, in God's story. Why he chose Abram, I've no idea. And I'm sure Abram had no idea. Now, I want to make several points this morning, but the first point I want to make is that it is God who makes the difference. It's God who takes the initiative. It's God who chooses Abraham. It's God who has the plan. It's God who can put the world right. And yet we run around thinking it's all up to us. We've got to put the world right. We've got to find God if he's there. But we can't even do that on our own. Look around the world. Why are there so many religions in the world? Because man needs God. And because he doesn't know God, he creates his own gods, his own beliefs. He's got to have meaning in life. So he creates ideas, philosophies, beliefs, religions in an attempt to give himself security. Now, I don't know what, well, for most of you here, I was going to say, I don't know what your religion is. For most of you here, I know you're believers in Jesus Christ. But there may be people here this morning for whom that is not yet the case. So I ask the question, nevertheless, what is your religion? What set of beliefs is your life based upon? Where do you get your security, your hope for the future, your meaning in life? Because without God, there is none of those things. There cannot be because we were created by him for a purpose. And unless we're fulfilling that purpose, we don't know him. And we don't know any of these wonderful truths. Atheists are religious. Did you know that? They make themselves their God. They have to. They have to depend on themselves to trust in themselves because they need God. In this country, many, many people look to material things for their security, for their meaning in life. That's their God. That's their religion. And they worship in the shopping malls and in the sports stadia and in the academies of cleverness. Everyone 
needs God. Whatever it is, we've all got something in our lives that we depend on, something that we worship. Bob Dylan sang a song years ago. He said, we've all got to serve somebody. Some people serve Jesus Christ. Many people serve other things and other people. But without God, the fact is that we're lost. And in Genesis 11, God says, I'm coming to find you. I'm coming to bring you home to me. I'm not going to let this carry on any longer. And God came into the world as a human being in the person of Jesus Christ. And by his death on the cross, he made it possible for us to be forgiven and to begin a new life at peace with God. And I use that word forgiven very deliberately because there is more to this than simply needing a meaning in life and future hope. There is a need for forgiveness because ultimately we have all rebelled against God. We've all basically said, I don't need you. I can run my own life. That is disobedience. That is rebellion. And if you're not sure whether you're living God's way or your own way, the answer is simple. Look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came and he lived every moment of his life by the will of his Father. He is our model in that sense. So if our lives do not conform to his life, we're living for ourselves or for someone or something else other than God. And that's the reality. We are rebels. We've broken God's laws. We've replaced them with our own. That's the way the world is in a mess. And we can't undo that. We can't change that. We can do good, don't get me wrong. And we should strive to deal with injustice and poverty and sickness and all these terrible things, violence that are in the world. We should do something, what we can do, but in the end we can't be the complete solution. Only God can. And Genesis chapter 11 is where God revealed his intention to work through one man, one family, to bring the whole of creation back to him, to restore it to what it was supposed to be. Abraham is given a promise. He's promised that he'll be the father of a great and mighty nation, Israel. And that through his nation, this nation, the whole world will be blessed. And as I've said, basically it's that promise in the history of Abraham's family, which is the theme of the most of the Old Testament, God steadily revealing more and more of himself to, to, to Abram and to his descendants. And in the New Testament, Jesus enters history as the savior of the world. And Abraham ever since, really, I suppose, has been the great example of faith in the Bible even though he lived 2,000 years or more before Jesus. And uh, in his life, there's a lot of things we can learn, I believe, from his life. Just want to pick out a few. First of all, it's this business of God taking the initiative. It's God who has the power. It's God who has the wisdom. It's God who has the love to deal with any situation we face at all. And think about Abraham's background. Abram was not from a believing family. He grew up in a land where people worshipped idols and false gods. In fact, the people where he lived worshipped the god of the moon. In fact, his father, Terah, that name comes from a Semitic word for moon. That was the worship, and no doubt Abram's family worshipped the moon god the same as everybody else did in their culture. But it didn't stop the one true god stepping into his life and saying, Abram, Go. Go where I send you. And it didn't stop Abram recognizing God's voice. That's the most amazing thing to me. God reveals himself. We do not discover God. If you think about how you became a Christian, was it by your efforts or did God reveal himself to you? Because my belief is we only know God because he shows himself to us in some way or another. And he showed himself to Abram. It's fascinating. He said, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Not to X or Y, you know, not to Egypt or to Syria, but I'll show you where. First of all, get on your feet and start going. We so often want to know where we're going when God says, I want you to go and do something. God just says, well, are you willing to go in the first place? If you want to know where you're going, that puts a question mark in my mind about whether you're willing to really do it or not. Will you go? That's the question. Not will you go to X or Y. Abram, go. And he goes and he gets to Canaan and God appears to him. 
As far as we know from Genesis, up until then, all Abram knew was that God had spoken to him. In, ver- in verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, The Lord had said to Abram. But then in verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham. And there he says, To your offspring I will give this land. He's now there. There's the land in front. He says, Look around. This is for you and your offspring. I brought you here for that. God speaks. Abram ag- obeys. Then God appears and reveals a little bit more of the story. God never tells us the whole story at once. He starts off with just what he knows is enough for us. And then as we move on, he reveals more and more and more. Don't try to get ahead of God. You'll fail anyway, and it's not worth the effort. The point is, God is in control. He comes to Abram, he speaks to Abram, he tells him what he wants him to do. And sometimes we behave as if it's all down to us. We have to seek God. We have to find God. No, we don't. He comes to us. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Read his word and God will speak. God comes looking for us. I don't know where you've ever tried to run away from God. There's a wonderful section in the Bible where David talks about running away from God. I've met people who are running away from God. But you know you can run as far as you like. God is still there. I once was pretty depressed, and I climbed a mountain, and I sat on top of the mountain. It was beautiful. I love mountains. And as I sat there, I don't know how this was, but I just knew God was there. It was like he was saying to me, it doesn't matter where you go, Richard. I'm there, and I'm accessible because I love you. I'm never, ever going to leave you. If God seems distant, that's a lie. He's as close as it's possible to imagine. But as I've said, God doesn't reveal his will all at once. We don't know why Abram's family set out for Canaan but then stopped at Haran. Terah must have had some sort of, I don't know, spurring from God to leave his home and move. But he got so far and he stopped there and we don't know why. All that matters is that they were meant to go to Canaan because God had said to Abram, get up and go, and he was wanting him to go to Canaan. But they got as far as Haran and then they stopped. In other words, they stopped halfway. I find that a huge personal challenge because sometimes God says to me, go, and I get going and then I stop halfway. I can't seem to follow through. Something happens. I'll tell you what happens later on. The point is, though, that when terror stopped, Abram had to stop. I believe that's probably because at that time in their culture, although Abram was married, he was still under the authority of his father. He was part of his father's household. So it was only when terror died that he was free to move on. That to me, is a challenge too because it reminds me of the commandment to honor our mother and father, to honor our parents. Abram did exactly that before the Ten Commandments were ever given. He honored his father by staying where his father stayed. But when his father died, then he was ready to go. Now, I believe that in God's economy, sometimes that's what happens. We find ourselves unable to move on, unable to go any further than we are at that time, and we don't understand that. God has said, go and do this, and we get so far, and there's a block in the way. Now, Abram spent time in Haran, and I don't know what he did while he was there, except that he obviously built up his family and all the rest of it, but I believe God had a purpose in him waiting. He was moving Abram from his familiar background and culture into something completely unknown, and that was not an easy thing for him to do, to leave behind his family, his culture, his people. It took a bit of an adjustment, and I wonder if those years spent in Haran was a sort of period of transition where he was adjusting to leaving his culture, his inheritance. Don't forget, his inheritance would have been his father's land, property, all sorts of things. Leave that behind to follow the God who called him. That took some doing. But when his father died, he was ready to go, and he went. Now, there are many of us here, and I know some of you particularly, don't like waiting. Don't like waiting hanging on, wondering what God's going to do next. We want to get on and do it, you know? Well, that's rough, really, because God's timing is always perfect. And if he says wait, the waiting is for our good. Now, at the moment, we are in a period as a church where we're kind of waiting. We're not quite sure what's going to happen next. The church has grown thanks to the blessing of God, and we need bigger premises, and we're looking at new premises and the possibility of purchasing premises or whatever, And it's a sort of in-between transition, uncertain time. I believe God wants to do something even while we're waiting. The question is, are we asking him, what do you want, Lord? What are you trying to teach me in this period? 
God is in control. He knows the next step and he will reveal it. While we wait, we need to continue to trust him and to serve him where we are. Sometimes people just, oh, I, you know, this is all right. I've got to move on. I've got to go move on. They don't know where they're going. They don't know if it's God telling them it's just itchy feet. And they're just so stressed out. They're not really serving God at all where they are, where he's placed them. We need to ask ourselves, am I serving God where I am right now? Because if not, I should be. What am I doing? God's timing is perfect. The point is, if we serve him where we are, we trust him where we are, our faith will be built up and we'll be ready for the next step when it comes. Otherwise, we won't. Come to Abram in a moment, going down to Egypt. I don't know whether it was the right thing for him to do or not, but I know this. He had to come back, but it only happened because God revealed his dishonesty to Pharaoh and Pharaoh kicked him out. He could have stayed in Egypt, and that was not God's plan for him. Are you settling for Egypt? Or are you willing to move on? Is it going to take God to give you a good boost at the backside, as he did Abram, for you to move on? Are you where God doesn't want you? That's the other question. Now, I don't mean necessarily physically. I don't mean necessarily in this church. But in your spiritual life, or in your life outside the church, if I can say that, are you where you should be? And if so, are you serving God there? Those are questions we've all got to face. God called Abram because he said, I'm going to bless you. And also he said, you will be a blessing. Here's the next thing. God wants to bless us, but he also wants to make us channels of blessing for other people. That's what he said to Abram. You will be a blessing. First thing he said was go, which wasn't easy. But then there is a promise. He says he's going to bless him. He's going to make his family name very great. And he says, and I'm going to bless other people through you. Now, as a people of God here, I believe that is true for us as well. God has a plan to bless others through us. We can be a holy huddle here if we want to every Sunday morning, coming along to worship, getting a sort of injection to keep us going through the week of spiritual high and excitement, and then the rest of the week we're sort of running downhill again until we come back for the next one next week. Is that what God wants? I don't think so. Any more than he wanted Abram and the Jewish people to settle for what they had and not share it with everybody else. And thank God, and I mean that, that they didn't stop there. After all, think about it. The first Christians were Jews. But they were ready, with a bit of nudging from God, to take the good news about Jesus further afield to the non-Jews. Otherwise, none of us here would have ever heard about Jesus. They obeyed that command. They understood that promise that the blessing wasn't just for them. Do we understand that what we have is not just for us? It's for the people outside. Can we rest comfortable just with Sunday morning enjoyment but not look forward to the work during the week, which is what we're really called to be? God said to Abram, go. He gave him a command. The other thing I think we need to understand from this story is that God makes, gives us commands. What is God commanding us to do? It may or may not be to leave our homes like Abram and go to a far off land, but whatever it is, are we going to be like terror, settling for the comforts of where we are, or are we going to be like Abram and say, okay, I'll go? That's the question. But finally, when Abram got to where he'd been sent, when he got to Canaan, what did he discover? Within no time at all, a famine. He must have said to himself, what's going on here? God says, go here and I'll bless you, or I'll bless your family, I'll make you a blessing to all. And there's a famine, God. How can that be right? I've got to say to you, it does seem to me that if we set out to follow God, we can expect to encounter huge obstacles. 
And our reaction to those obstacles is absolutely critical. If we say, oh, this can't be the will of God, I'm going somewhere else, forget it. That's not it. That's not the way to respond at all. What did Abram do? Unfortunately, <laughs> he took matters into his own hands. Now, that's the other thing we do, isn't it? We get an obstacle and we say, oh, well, I know what to do about that. And we rely upon our own reason, our own power, our own strength, say, I can sort this out. We never consult God at all. We don't ask ourselves, what is God doing through this obstacle? What is he saying to me, to the church, through this obstacle? The fact that we may not get this building. If we don't, well, what does that mean? Does it mean we have to go and you know, give a backhander to the council? I don't think so. But you see, that's what some people might think. You know? I don't know. Or they might think, oh, well, I know somebody who knows somebody. He can have a word in the right ear. Is that what we're supposed to do? I shouldn't think so. So what will it mean if it happens? When Abram saw the famine, he left for Egypt. I don't know whether God wanted him to do that or not. But the end up was he ended up depending on himself instead of upon God. Because he was afraid, he was afraid the Egyptian men would kill him so they could have Sarah, he lied. And he didn't just lie, he involved Sarah in the lie as well. And put her into a terrible situation. It says in the scripture that she was taken into the house of Pharaoh. Well, we all know what that means. And then, because God was not prepared for this to go on, he exposed Abram's lies so that he would be sent back to where he was supposed to be. Now, that seems to me a terrifying intervention by God. And it says to me, if I'm prepared to go down that road of doing things my way, even to the point of lying, God is quite ready to expose me in order to get me back on the road again. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't know about you. Do we want God to expose us for what we really are? when we're not following him, when we're not obeying him? Or will we come to him now and say, sorry, Lord, I got it wrong. Help me to put it right. Help me to get back on the track. You know, we do this so often in our lives, don't we? We go off along our own little ideas. We do things our way. And we don't realize how much it grieves God's heart and how much it interferes with his opportunity to bless us. Obstacles are meant to be blessings. They're sent to, somebody said they're sent to make us, not to break us. And how we respond to obstacles. Do we depend on God to see us through, or do we go back as Abram did to depending on himself? You see, Abram's problem was that he thought God sometimes had a need of a helping hand. You know, you read the rest of the story, there's many occasions, then that's it. Do we think God needs a hand? I don't think so. He's able to do what he wants to do. But the wonderful thing is he wants to use you and me. Abram is a man of faith, but occasionally that faith failed him. I'm re reassured by that. But I want to be like him. I want to follow him. I want to go where God sends me. I want to be a blessing to others. Do you want to do that? Let's all do it together, shall we?